Welcome to GovCast. I'm your host, Jordan McDonald. Today, I'm talking to Mangala Koopa about her role as a CAIO of the Department of Labor. This episode is brought to you by Maximus. At Maximus, we are focused on driving continuous innovation to deliver impactful outcomes for our customers and the people they serve. Integrating experience and domain expertise with AI-enabled technologies, our solutions enhance efficiencies, reduce costs, and empower data-driven decision-making. With Maximus, agencies achieve resilient operations that can adapt, scale, and evolve to meet their changing customer and mission needs. We are dedicated to building a smarter, more efficient future that moves people, technology, and government forward. Learn more at Maximus.com slash federal. Hi, Mangala. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. Mangala, could you sort of, you know, just start me through your journey? How did you, you know, become the CAIO and what is the role and what are the responsibilities of the chief artificial intelligence officer? I think for me, it's a natural progression of my leadership, both in public sector and private sector for over two decades now. I'm also the chief technology officer. So um, I manage enterprise architecture, emerging technology, enterprise data, warehouse solutions, records management. All of those actually have an integral part with AI. CIO, I think, also helps to have a great understanding of AI and experience building AI systems. Coincidentally, during my postgraduate studies, I chose you know, artificial intelligence and image processing as two focus areas. And that's been a while. But little did I know that both these technologies would be defining technologies of our time. So that's a little bit about how I got into this role. Previously, before the chief technology officer, I managed all of the mission systems for 27 DOL agencies as the director of business application services. So all of that expertise and experience actually helps me to to be a, a good CIO in this role. And so, you know, I feel like the definition of what a chief artificial intelligence officer really depends on the agency where you're at. For you at the Department of Labor, what does that role look like? What are the responsibilities of the chief artificial intelligence officer? So I think, you know, the MMO defines at a very high level what is expected of a CIO. And you're absolutely right. Depending on how your agency is structured and also who the CIO is, you know, in in, in department, I'm also the CTO and a CIO, right? In other agencies, you have a CDAO, chief data officer as the CIO or somebody else in different roles. So I think for, for, for us, what we have done is at a more, uh, you know, practical responsibilities level, we have defined AI as nine work streams that we need to make, make progress in. Um, if you go on to dol.gov slash AI, you see our compliance plan. And you will see all of the nine work streams that we talk about there. So so from a practical standpoint, I see my role as making sure we mature in all those nine work streams because they're essential for for a responsible AI implementation. And of course, it also starts with defining what is going to be our AI strategy and how can we put a framework in place together to go on AI at the department. You know, that includes engaging with stakeholders across different levels and different layers, partnering with our agencies, you know, partnering with internal and external stakeholders. So all of that, I think, is part of really the role of CIO. I actually see CIO as the glue that brings together the necessary skills to to implement a responsible AI at at the department. And so thinking about the responsibilities of the role and the way that labor in particular is um, thinking about it. You mentioned these nine AI work streams. How is the agency thinking about AI and where does it see, you know, with the, within these work streams, applications that can help uh, improve workflows or uh, better enhance the agency's functions? So um, our acting secretary has um, established a worker-centric vision for AI. You know, um, just yesterday, I think we released our best practices where she spoke about AI must work for workers. So we are grounded in that not star principle. So what we want to do here at the department is be intentional with AI. We want to make sure that AI actually is used to enrich jobs and ultimately improve our services to the public. So we have the nine work streams work in parallel together with the ultimate goal 
to improve efficiency of our operations, right? And if you go on to devol.gov uh, slash AI, we post our use cases. Um, and we are also actually going to refresh that list by December, um, I think 16th, where you will probably see close to 30 use cases at department and in various different segments. I mean, I'm really excited to see uh, that list of use cases. Could you sort of walk us through some of those use cases and how the agency has tackled the use of AI already? So I'm going to walk you through a way to think about use cases in a technology lens because it kind of gives a scope and context of what kind of use cases come about, right? So starting with just using generative AI out of the box, you know, which is we all know GPT is a famous synonym for <laughs> generative AI. We have that. We have, um, you know, made secure chat GPT available to all of our staff. Um, and and uh, and 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 right out of the box, people can use it to summarize documents, write email, create draft memos, and things of that nature. From there, you know, you go into use cases that when you ground the foundational models in your data, in your context, you get a lot more valuable use cases out of that. And technology-wise, they're called RAG applications, right? So with that, you get a lot of assistance. So for example, we have an assistant that uh, people can talk to and get information about acquisition kind of details. You know, uh, we are planning on building assistance to uh, where people, where my our staff can search about information about maybe onboarding or um, where to find different uh, policies and rules around that the world produces, right? So these are kind of RAG assistance that we have. That's one kind of application. Then we also have a lot of applications in natural language processing. For example, we may have trainings that instead of a person like me, you know, walking through the training with voice, we can use natural language processing abilities to convert text to voice, right? We can uh, improve data quality by, you know, if there is an interview that people are conducting and if we need to record that interview, a lot of times folks would have to manually take notes. And, you know, sometimes we can use NLP processes to convert voice to text as well. So we have those examples. Then we also have examples where using custom modeling and now we're more moving into using generative AI with fine tuning, where we take our data and use that in the data processing applications. Perhaps, you know, auto coding things with that. You know, that's a set of, you know, fine tuning applications that we're working on. Um, we also have, you know, at least one use case where we're trying to bring augmented reality into training environments because some of our inspectors have to go into work sites that are, um, that are hazardous, right, sometimes. So training in a augmented reality, mixed reality helps to prepare for those visits. So we have those applications as well. The one thing that I am um, excited about that we are rolling out uh, pretty extensively here at the department is trying to use AI behind the scene, mm. you know, uh, we are uh, giving licenses to our developers so that they can use AI to code. And that's honestly is a, a very effective way to bring about efficiency and, and improve our services because the time to market build something and time to bring it to use is going to be accelerated with the use of automated coding. Plus, you know, the risks associated with the AI, the entire coding life cycle, we go through very rigorous checks of security and, you know, 508 and other things. So it embeds very well into our natural systems development life cycle. And I don't mean it just for high code applications, right? It can also be for, you know, low code platforms offer AI, AI features inside. So we're exploring that a lot because we think that that's a way to gain efficiencies in our operations. Absolutely. And this is really exciting to hear about some of these use cases. And uh, I hope, you know, our audience will dive into more of them, considering you've got, what, 30 <laughs> in the works. Magal, now, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of potential around AI, but I know there's a lot of skeptic skepticism and fear around it as well. Within the DOL's workforce, how are you working towards getting your employees, um, those in the agency, comfortable with using AI and seeing the potential of it to enhance their workflow instead of you know being afraid that it might take their job or uh, make their work irrelevant. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And you hit on a very important topic, a very important question, which is 
that is an absolute essential element to focus on for any agency. You know, we spend a lot of time on AI literacy. First of all, you have to communicate the intent, which our acting secretary has set a really good stage for us and, and to embrace that philosophy of using AI to enrich jobs and protect from its risks, right? Um, if you read our compliance plan, which is available on dworld.gov slash AI, you see that we you know, we have a lot of progress we made in AI literacy, but we will continue to um, really engage our, our, our workers in the AI literacy because ultimately what I like to see is each and every one of our staff understand AI from their own perspective, not listening to be, not listening to somebody else. They understand it enough so that they can make cost and themselves, you know, what this technology presents and what the risks might be. So I think that AI literacy is how we're trying to make sure that the people um, don't fear it, understand it, and under understand its fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, AI, it's a very new technology, really emerging. There's a lot of potential. No one really knows exactly where it's going to go. I want to ask, you know, as one of the... Uh, earliest leaders when it comes to the CAIO role, specifically at labor, but with also within government, what lessons are you taking from other CAIOs? What lessons are you sharing with them? How are you, uh, I guess, this small community that's still trying to figure itself out, working together in order to better understand how AI functions and then understand how AI functions within government? So you're right. So the technology is moving so fast. You almost have to learn from each other to keep up. You cannot individually learn fast enough, you know. So what I am encouraged with is we have a CIO council that's uh, that's chaired by OMB and OSTP, right? We meet frequently in that council. We have work groups which focus on different things within the council. So we meet there. Uh, we also call each other from time to time to see what, what each agency is doing. We engage in conferences and activities together. So there is a lot of sharing that is happening. And I certainly, you know, engage with those forums to see what other agencies are doing. The purpose is maybe if some agency has figured out how to do something, we can gain from that knowledge and not have to reinvent the wheel here at the department. So we are certainly doing that in terms of sharing from other CIOs. And it's not limited to just government, right? The technology is so vast and so rapidly evolving that we need to share from not just the government, but also the private sector and even academic institutions that are doing some good work in this area. So we try and stay ahead with all of that. And and um, I have very regular meetings with a lot of uh, vendors in the space of VI to learn and understand what's going on in the private sector. So perhaps we can bring that into the government and benefit from that technology. I think you have a second part of that question where, what do you share? Again, through these mechanisms, you know, we whatever we create we share one example of that is um if you go to ai.gov and you can see each other's use cases for example we share trainings through a opm work group and we post them on max.gov so there is a lot of cross learning happening in this space and and that's encouraging because you need that absolutely and so i want to touch on that too because you mentioned uh, throughout our conversation these partnerships the stakeholders that are involved how are you all collaborating together to you know uh, build a foundation for the government's use of AI. So in, inside DYO, uh, we have um, many forums. So, you know, it starts with the AI governance board, obviously, where, as you may have heard, uh, a department, we included our union partners there, and we are very fortunate that they're part of that, uh, th that uh, mechanism to collaborate with. We have a monthly forum. Uh, with all our agency, DYL is a fairly larger size organization, and, and we have about 27 agencies within. So making sure that we have that partnership going on with agencies is critical. So we have that. You know, we we created a community of interest forum to reach out to all DYL staff where we uh, sometimes provide training. Sometimes we bring people to talk about AI. The idea is that our staff need to hear and learn as much as they can about this new technology and how it might impact them. 
and we have many more forums. We meet with our unions quarterly. Um, our, you know, development of modernization of applications. We we include uh, users uh, as part of the agile development methodology. So there's a lot of engagement internally that is happening. And as, as I said, my role is a glue in making sure that you are maintaining that centralized governance for AI because AI's impact can be very profound. Um, especially the risks that AI presents can be can be uh, very very dangerous, right? So we have to make sure that there is a a forum and a mechanism in, in which you're meaningfully governing AI and ensuring that it's responsible here at DOL. Absolutely. You know, throughout the conversation, we've talked about the potential, the risk of AI. I want to ask as a closing question, what are you, I suppose, most looking forward to or most concerned about when it comes to the technology? Uh, where is the future of AI and what are you keeping your eyes on? I think, you know, I am an optimist. <laughs> you know, uh, nobody has the crystal ball, uh, as you know. Everybody will give you an answer based on what their perception of the future might be. Okay. I'm an optimist. I am a technologist. And I would bet on humanity anytime. Right. So I am looking forward to see how AI can drastically improve what we do, you know, and not not just, you know, within the DOL. Ultimately, it has to make a meaningful difference to the public that we serve. So I look forward to seeing how that transformation would play out in the coming years. You know, uh, certainly we are doing everything in our power to to make sure that that's positive. Right. And. I think, you know, I I believe that I've seen in the last one year, for example, right? So as 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 collective community, whether it's us or you or private sector, everyone, slowly the understanding of AI is improving. It's not fast enough if you compare with the you know, rate of pace of change of technology. But if it's fast enough, if you think of other technologies and how quickly they got adapted, technologies of this nature, right? So there is a hope. So I see the progress already in that space. And I think we're going to find that um, technologies like AI or quantum or any improvement in robotics, I think eventually we will find a sweet spot where we augment ourselves with these technologies. And, and, and create an environment where, you know, it's safe for us to use them, but also we are able to tackle the bigger challenges that, that we otherwise were not able to tackle in the future. So I look forward to that AI for good scenario. Um, I take uh, great inspirations from projects like Alpha Fold, you know, that helped humanity. You know, I, I think AI has the potential to truly uh, make a difference in the lives of people. And if we all are intentional about doing good with it, I think we can get there. Well, I look forward to all of that as well. Um, Mangala, thank you so much for taking the time out to chat with us and excited to see uh, all the new artificial intelligence agents, uh, initiatives that are coming out of the Department of Labor. Thank you for having me. In closing, I, I do want to say that we have two things that um, actually help us a great deal. One is uh, we centralized all IT support through shared services. Uh, within the OCIO organization, which is where the CIO role lies. And that already has a mechanism in which we work with the agencies in partnership. And we are aware of all of the mission uh, systems that support mission areas. It's, it's a great um, you know, foundation we have that, that, that we, can, uh, we can work on. And the second thing I want to highlight here at the DOL is that our acting secretary, even before the Gen AI revolution came about, put together a AI uh, the data enterprise data strategy, you know, advocating for our programs to publish more of our data for public consumption. So there's a lot of work done by our chief data chief data officer, and we provide um, IT support to the chief data officer as well. And we are partnering together. You know that AI is nothing without data, right? So those two foundational pieces that we have in place actually make it make that makes it easy for us to engage the whole of the organization and, and focus more on use cases rather than you know building the foundations right now. Absolutely, that totally makes sense to me. Well, thank you so much again. That was actually great because my last question was gonna be, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to touch on? <laughs> and you've already jumped it. Um, we're on time, you know, the whole team came here early. Uh, this is a very great, really smooth interview. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thanks for having me.